Hi guys, I'm Jo Croft. You are listening to the Puppy Coach Podcast. Join me as I share my top tips, thoughts and experiences from my career as a vet nurse and canine behaviour specialist, helping owners form a strong, safe relationship with their dog. Hi guys, so today we have got Abby Reid with us, who is my gun dog training coach, um, who Hogan and I spend a bit of time with. I wanted to get her on today because I wanted to just explore the gun dog world with her, just pick her brains a little bit and see if we can get some information for you guys as to how you progress really into the gun dog training world. So Abby actually was previously, and I didn't know this, a full-time tennis coach. So she did that for 22 years, got herself a little Labrador puppy and was initially self-taught using reference books and DVDs, which actually is a brilliant way to learn. Experiential learning is probably the best way to kind of work through your mistakes and actually get a really good outcome. She then went on to become an IABT dog instructor and gain a diploma in psychology and she's worked for three years as an assistant gun dog trainer to get experience from a mentor. She then started River Lily in 2012 and has been running a very successful gun dog training business ever since then. You've been fairly busy, Abby. Um, yeah, pretty busy. Yeah, I could say that. <laughs> so, and I know I can never get hold of you. So um, I know that continues every day, including weekends. Um, hence why we're doing this on a Friday night, which is great fun. I just wanted to kind of start from the beginning, really. I mean, it's always quite interesting to understand how people come to work with dogs. I mean, dogs are obviously hobbies for lots of people and passion for lots of people, but not everybody goes into um actually you know producing a business and spending that kind of work time with them as well so tell me a little bit about the the tennis period and you know what you got up to there and then your transition into the gun dog world well I guess I started playing tennis when I was 10 so that's like a long time ago now and um I really really enjoyed it and my tennis coach at the time when I was 16 said look would you like to come along on a Friday night and just help me teach some of the youngsters And I guess that's where it all started. I then went away to uni and I got myself a degree in Spanish just because I thought, you know what, I'll go and coach tennis in Spain because it's hot and sunny. Uh, However, I never made it to Spain because I actually got a job at a local tennis centre, one of the performance centres in Great Britain, one of the top two. So I thought, oh my goodness, I can't go to Spain now because I just landed this amazing job at Batchwood Tennis Centre. Yeah, so I stayed there for 22 years. The last four years of that tennis coaching career, I'd actually got myself a young Labrador puppy who's now 14, actually, still going strong. Oh, I was going to say, have you still got her? Yeah, that's oh. Maya. Yeah, you might have seen her on, like, you know, Facebook and Instagram. Yeah. Oh, lovely. So, yeah, yeah, she's amazing. She's like, she's blind and deaf, but she still, she still goes for daily walks and goes swimming and everything. So, yeah, I got myself this black Labrador working puppy, and that's where it all started, really. So did you just not know what to do with her? Was she a classic high-energy working drive black lab? She was a total Ferrari, and and between you and me and anyone who happens to be listening, I actually think if she'd have gone to somebody who knew what they were doing, she could possibly be a field trial champion. Oh, She's okay. just... She's just amazing, but she had me who didn't know anything. So <laughs> I didn't teach her to walk to heel. I'd let her off and she'd run off and see everyone, chase birds, chase rabbits and everything in the beginning. But that's when I went and I got myself a gun dog trainer and it all turned around from there, really, when she was 18 months old. So the gun dog training, now that obviously, you know, we're looking at 13, 14 years ago, and I know for sure gun dog training, the, that world then was very different to what it is now. And I know we've had a conversation not so long ago where I said to you, you know, I was blown away to find you because I was very hesitant about exploring that with Hogan because I hadn't heard that, you know, some of the methods that are still used in the gun dog world can be questionable. So back then, kind of 14 years ago, what was your experience of that? There was a definite mix. I was lucky because the lady that, that I went to was a very sort of positive gun dog trainer. There wasn't so many treats on offer. Like I turned up with my bag of treats and that wasn't the norm, yeah. you know, but there wasn't any hard handling. I did go and see other trainers who, you know, for whatever reason, didn't train very positively as if the dog got it wrong, they'd tell it off or more. But I was lucky I didn't actually go and see anybody who was like that. And if I did, I just didn't go back. 
So how was your, or how did your journey then progress? Because obviously, uh, you know, you had to learn on the ground and learn from somebody else. So at what point did you kind of decide, you know what, I'm going to, I know enough and I've got enough under my belt to actually do something for myself. What, did it start off as a hobby doing the classes yeah. and stuff? Yeah, it started off as a hobby. And I think, as I mentioned earlier, I had four years of crossover when I was still coaching tennis yeah. and training my dogs. So. We got uh, our second Labrador probably 14 months later. And by then I was hooked. I was really enjoying it. Like I was obsessed. I was training Myra every day. I went, joined lots of different clubs, uh, went to all different trainers around the country, just like a little sponge, just learning yeah. everything. And I guess what was really lucky for me was Maya was really good. She kind of just did it. You know, after I'd righted all the wrongs that I'd, I'd made with her in the beginning. <laughs> um and she, because she was so keen, so good, it was just really fun, real pleasure to go and learn new stuff with her. Oh, well, you know, you've seen me work Hogan and I struggle sometimes to contain my excitement <laughs> when he does something. <laughs> I mean, an absolute shock that I've given him one command and he just knows what he's doing. The gun dog world is is something that I do for fun. You know, it's not something that I coach in or know anywhere near enough about. So I think they're amazing like that. that so much of, of that genetic programming is just there when you find what buttons to actually press. It's just exactly. amazing. Exactly. Yeah, I always say to the clients, like, actually, the first time your dog ever stops on the whistle while he's hunting and you give him a command which he follows, it's actually better than the day you get married. It's just the most <laughs> exciting time ever because it's like... Oh my goodness, I've trained this dog and we're now a team. Yeah. Because absolutely. you've taught him what the whistle means, you've taught him what a left hand command means, and he's just done it. It does just give you such a an amazing buzz that you've got that relationship with your dog. And you know, I totally get how you would come into the world of working with dogs and then just want to know and know and know more and more and more. If you want to be successful with them, then you have to just make it your life. It's not something you can do for five minutes a day. No, I, I think probably in the last 14 years, um, I've been training pretty much every single day. Yeah. And, and for me, like through River Lily, uh, River Lily Working Dogs, is like we must see thousands of people a year now. And yeah. every dog teaches you something new. Yeah. Every single dog. Not, not just, and also the people as well, you know, but just dealing with all the different breeds and different characters. It's yeah. just amazing. So what sort of breeds are you seeing, Abby? I mean, um, pretty much the, the, the classes that I've done have all been labs of various different shapes, sizes and colours. But I know that through my behaviour work, I've sent you various different spaniels and, you know, different breeds. But I don't know how far they go. You know, do they just come for the obedience side of it? Do they do well? If I was to say rock up with, I don't know, German Shepherd or <laughs> are you laughing? <laughs> Any breed or even a terrier. I mean... Obviously, age comes into consideration here. Ten-year-old terrier is really not going to want to do that. You know, if they're young enough, would you give it a go? I mean, have you given it a go? Have you tried other breeds? Yeah, to be fair, at, at River Lily, we are specifically just gun dog or gun dog crosses, yeah. you know, to come for lessons. But I do run another pet dog business, actually, Daisy Lane Pet Dog Training School. All right. So all breeds, all breeds of all ages, all sizes, you know, little fluffy dogs, big, big dogs, they can all come and do obedience and you know there's a little bit of gun dog sort of retrieving included in that yeah as well as agility and everything but you can actually teach you know I've seen German shepherds out on shoots picking up yeah. birds that's why I asked you because I have seen one out I was a bit shocked I know from what I know working with dogs that you know they're pretty malleable if you get them early enough and dogs got a good relationship with the owner you can generally get them to adapt to most things within reason and actually yeah. the whole bring it back to me and give it the situation I use with everything you know I use the little the Les Graham retrieval role for everything from terriers up to Rottweilers because I think it just teaches them to interact with their owners and and have that relationship where they're used to giving up you know a high prize resource so I think the gun dog world actually transfers really really well in a lot of cases. To do well in it you need to go on a shooting field or competitive gun dog work you need a really really obedient dog which yeah. gun dog training will give you if you follow it, you know, properly. <laughs> so are you are you doing you're doing shoots as well? So you're you're obviously in that world because there's obviously some people that just want to do it 
for the obedience side with their dog. And then there's some people that are working on farms or they're in, in that world out with pheasants and such like. So what do you do, Abby? Do you do a bit of both? Yeah, I do both. I spend the summers doing working tests, which are competitions on dummies, gun dog dummies. Yeah. Go all around sort of like the local area and all around the country, really. We go and do working tests pretty much every weekend, or we did before COVID, but, you know, now we're getting back into it. And then the winter, out of my 10 Labradors, there's three that are puppies, but my other seven, we all go picking up probably three or four times a week yeah. out on shoots. So... Yeah, my dogs do have a nice life. We carry on our training in the winter, but not as much as in the summer because they're out picking up pheasants and partridge on shoots and stuff. I didn't know there was that many shoots that went on. So they're going on a week. They're not just on weekends then. No, no, no. You, you, any day but Sunday. You can't oh. shoot on a Sunday. Well, you can shoot vermin on a Sunday. So just tell us a little bit about that. So, I mean, I know from my horsey world where I keep my horse, we've got a, a gamekeeper up there that breeds pheasants and such like, but I get really confused with what the hell's going on, really, <laughs> to be honest, apart from you don't go there, don't touch this and don't breathe on my pheasants because they are ridiculous and run in the road and get themselves in a whole heap of trouble. But yeah, it's big money from what I can make out. You know, there's... The, the pheasants, I've just lost a bit of my horse's field, um, just lost a bit of his paddock to sweet corn, which is pheasant cover. So I'm not very impressed with the whole thing. Yeah. Right now he's just lost um, about a third of his grass to pheasant cover. So just tell me, what do you know about, what's the point of this? You know, there will be people that don't like the idea of this kind of hunting thing. And, you know, the dogs are bringing the birds back once they're shot and killed. So the dogs are not handling live birds, are they? Oh, yeah, they, they are handling live birds. Um, basically, if you're part of the picking up team, so yeah, that's yeah. The, the team of dogs behind the guns. Yeah. I, I don't know if you know much about shooting. Basically, no, no, no. you have a team of beaters. Mm-hmm. Okay, this is on a driven shoot day. You have a team of beaters with their dogs who beat towards a line of guns. That's basically pushing the birds forward along the ground. Okay. So all the birds are sort of like scuttling forwards and the beaters push them to what's called a flushing point yeah okay then of the birds take off and the guns are waiting for them yeah okay then basically there's shooting and and everything the picking up dogs are there to pick up the birds that have been shot but are not shot dead Oh so, no! So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a real no, 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 I'm gonna. I, I do have. I do have a, like an argument to back up why you know it, it's not such a terrible thing. Yeah. So sure. you have the dogs to to collect the birds that need dispatching immediately. You know, for humane reasons. Okay. So this oh, is why okay. you, you you need a really well trained dog. Yeah. Who yeah. will who will you know leave the dead ones because you can go and pick them up yourself. Yeah. You need a dog that you can turn and line out. And handle him onto a bird that actually needs picking up immediately oh, while all the, okay. you me, while all the shooting is going on, and that's hours of practice because you've got all the distraction of the shoot carrying on, and you're asking your dog to go and pick up a specific bird. Right. Okay. Um. You can also hunt your dog up to pick it up, obviously. But if you can line your dog up, which is what we're training Hogan for, you yeah, know, going off your arm in a straight line, stopping handling. Yeah. You can pick that bird that needs picking. It could be brought back, humanely dispatched, job done. Okay, okay, I get it. Okay, yeah. And then obviously you then sweep and you find all the birds that are, you know, still on the ground. Yeah, so, um, so the ones that are suffering are not are not going to be suffering. The, yeah. you know, the whole point yeah. is, to, is to alleviate that problem. So yeah. I actually didn't know that at all. But, yeah, and then, and then what happens, all the, the game gets hung up on the game cart. Yeah. Okay, and it goes and gets put in... Um, Cooling, cooling oh god what's the, what's the word fridges so you go back and puts in in like coolers yeah okay and then the game dealer comes he picks them up and the birds go into the food chain okay so a lot of my friends say oh how can you do it and i'm like well actually that poor chicken that you bought from tesco yeah, absolutely i agree ha- with that has yeah. spent its life in a, in a cage can't wander about can't fly can't eat what you want yeah no life whatsoever. These pheasants and partridges have a great life. Yeah. You know, so that's... Well, well yeah. and they have a life because they, and I know this for fact, they would not even have a life if it wasn't for this industry because they're specifically bred for purpose. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're not native to this country. So if shooting ends, there'd be no pheasants and no, like, French partridges and stuff in Great Britain. Yeah. 
because they're not native birds to here. So it's actually really interesting. Labradors have always been my thing. And I can remember with well, my very first lab came out with me on the horse when he was about two years old and a pheasant, it was actually, I think it was an injured pheasant that went up in front of him and us. And I'll never forget, he, he shot off after, and I was a lot younger and not doing canine behaviour then, I was still very nursing. <laughs> and he shot off after this pheasant. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> what the hell? I'm going to get in so much trouble. And he literally went out. This is with zero training. I mean, he was so, he just did his own thing, Merlin. He, he, I didn't do any obedience stuff with him at all. He, he told me what he was doing. Um, but he went out after this bird and I jumped off the horse in a big panic, called him back, and he literally spat on a hairpin and delivered me this bird in a perfect sit. It didn't even have any saliva on it, Abby. Like, there wasn't yeah. a feather on its back. It had a bit of a funny leg. There's some injury to it. But he hadn't done any damage at all. And that was my yeah. first kind of awareness yeah. of actually the genetic component that's been bred into these dogs. Yeah, yeah. they and just they... just do it. That's why if, if you have a gun dog breed, even if you never plan to take it on a shoot, I'm always saying to people, you must train it yeah. as a gun dog. So if you own a spaniel, you must go and learn about how a spaniel hunts. You know, so when you let it off the lead, you understand how you can train him to keep him close as your pet spaniel. Yeah. Because we're seeing lots of issues at the minute where people are getting these highly motivated young dogs, Labradors, Spaniels, HPRs, yeah. Yeah. you name it. Because they don't understand what the breed was bred for and they just take them on what we call a family walk. Yeah. They get themselves in all sorts of trouble because actually the dog wants to go hunting. Yeah. And if you don't go hunting with your dog and control that hunt, so he's working for you, that is when you'll find your spaniel or your Labrador or, or whatever in the next county without you. Yeah. Because they soon work out that actually you don't you can't speak dog. Yeah. And they go, Well, you don't know what you're doing, so I think I'll go and amuse myself. Yeah. And so, I've had had exactly that conversation with a friend today who's done a bit of gun dog stuff. She's a dog walker too, and we're managing a spaniel between us because she's doing the kind of dog walking training during the dog walk, and I've done the behaviour stuff. And the whole thing's quite frustrating because we know where this is going to end up. We know where this is going to end up. You know, it's, it's the dog is just waiting for that opportunity to have enough confidence to run off and have a yeah. nice time after a bird and, yeah. and that's a done deal and then later down the line we're pretty much what I'm seeing now which is what I want to pick your brains on a little bit what I'm getting coming to me through vet referral which is very sad which is where this has gone terribly wrong is severe obsessive compulsive behaviors so I'm talking yeah. about shadow chasers I'm talking about tail spinning reacting to reflection so you know sunlight yeah. in people's watches particularly in the springer I would say they're worse and the working cockers are resource guarding generally yeah That's the yeah. Two kind of prevalent behavior issues that I'm seeing in in both those dogs and my instinct is very much to be like right okay I need to kind of dig deep and find that innate drive to try and counter condition and and teach these dogs you can do this and have a much nicer time you can have that dopamine hit doing this but I'm questioning and I you know I, I would send these guys to you so I'm questioning whether at this point has it gone too far is it is it retrievable and if so how would you go about even starting that process I mean it, it is retrievable but once it's got to like you know tail spinning shadow chasing butterfly you know or pollen watching you know that's when it's an awful lot of work to bring it back. Yeah. But you can do it. So that's why we're trying to get people early. So at River yeah. Lily, we start lessons at 10 weeks old. As soon as yeah. you've had your second jab, you can come to lessons and we can just show you or tell you what your Spaniel or your Labrador actually wants to do every time you leave your front door. Yeah. And then on your walks, you have to train it. You can't yeah. just walk it, let it off and chat with your friends. Yeah. Like, you know, the idea is you can do that when they're older and they're trained, but when yeah. they're young, you've got to structure every single walk. And then hopefully you don't get to that level, you know, you've just described where actually, you know, they're, you know, watch, you know, the shadows on your watch, you yeah. know, the light reflecting. Hopefully it won't get to that. 
And have you heard or come across any that have been put on any kind of neuromodulatory drugs by vets? Have you seen any that have come because they're getting sent to me? Um, the vets, to be honest, the local to me know me pretty well and, and are not doing this. But I have had, you know, different vets that maybe haven't had a behaviourist, but the clients found me. Um, and these dogs are coming to me on, you know, variations of things, but Prozac being one of them. Have you, have you had any come to you on drugs and, or have you got any experience of that? I mean, uh, not personally at River Lily, but what we tend to do is with gun dogs, as I said before, it's a totally obedient dog that needs to be focused on his or her owner. Yeah. So at, I mentioned before Daisy Lane. We have an amazing trainer at Daisy Lane who is really good at getting all breeds to focus on their owner with fun drills, fun games and everything. Yeah. So we will quite often say, look, you can't do your gun dog training until your dog will actually appreciate the fact that you're at the end of the lead. Yeah. Appreciate the fact that you're in the same field. Yeah. yeah. So we're sort of saying, like, go back a few paces, do your basic obedience, so do your heel work, your sit stage, your recall, do your puppy manners. Yeah. You know, or anything that you want your dog to learn is good behavior. Get that all ingrained and then you can come back and start doing your gun dog training adventure. So that's kind of how we deal with it at River Lily. But personally, I, haven't had, I don't think anyone's come to me with a dog who's been on on medication. And presumably, if you, you know, particularly for me, if I sent you one of these dogs, you know, you'd start out on a a one-to-one level with them first. You wouldn't try and, I'm just thinking of people, if they're thinking, oh, actually, I might try that. Everyone new at River Lily um, has to have a one-to-one anyway, uh, unless they're under six months old and they join our puppy groups. So, yeah, you'd have a one-to-one, you'd have like an assessment. And then depending on what like the nature of the behaviour is that needs fixing, we'd take you to different grounds, you know, and, and we could work with you and just try and teach you what what your spaniel's actually thinking, you know, what he's thinking when every time you let him off the lead or actually what he's thinking when he's on the lead as well. Just try and build this amazing bond back, you yeah. know, with, with the owner and the dog. So regarding the whole family pet thing, I have got a very, I think he's very good. I'm sure you think he's all right. My Hogs. With Hogan's Hogan brilliant. No, I think he's amazing. We love Hogan. I'm very proud of him and what he does. But he's also a family pet. And I'm obviously, you know, a working mum with two kids. I've got a horse. It's a pretty hectic life. I do know that the first two years of his life, we did a hell of a lot. That's where his grounding definitely comes from. That's where yeah. he remembers all this stuff. And then it, I had to back off for a year. Uh, so I'm just curious as to... Um, you know, if you found this, because you'll be training and doing as much with your dogs in those first 18 months to two years. But I actually, you know, in all honesty, I feel like I didn't get the balance quite right. We were filming Hogan for the first year of his life. It was pretty much pretty full on every single day. When it actually came to a point where I looked at him and we were doing walks and even when I was asking nothing of him, he was still asking me if I wanted him to do something. Like I literally had to have a year of telling him to just go away and learn to be a dog. I mean, yeah. do you like it's the same in the horse world? We kind of turn horses away to learn to be horses before that we actually ask anything of them. And if you do find that with yours, because you're obviously using yours for fun, hobby, and work, have you found that with any of your dogs, or are you just doing so much training all of the time that you know they don't really need that off time, so it's not a problem? My young puppies, obviously, I train them the basic foundations of any dog, any breed, like recall, sit, stay, heel work, nice, nice manners. Yeah, but I don't put any sort of structure really into their training until they're eight or nine months old. So I do all that basic obedience yeah. to start yeah. with, and I might throw the odd dummy and start them off hunting and everything because actually I want to see what their little characters are like. So then I can like mold them and train them all differently because all my ten dogs are totally different characters. Train yeah. them differently, but still to get to the same end result. So yeah. what's what's really helped me is seeing all the thousands of dogs through River Lily and going, oh, yeah, you know, when that dog did that, we fixed it by doing this. Yeah. You know, and I've got all that sort of behavior and mannerisms in my mind. Yeah. So I, in answer to your question, um, I am on them quite a lot from sort of age seven or eight months, gun dog wise, up yeah. to about two years, you know, and then all the groundwork is in there. Mm-hmm. and then obviously I do keep training them keep training keep training but I afford them a little bit more free time so you know I don't do big group walks but Rooster who's now nearly two you know I will obviously go on a little group walk with friends and he can just be a dog 
you know, but he's a dog with good manners because he understands the rules are you come back when you're called and you don't tow me around the countryside. Yeah. How is he, by the way? Because the last time I saw him, it was obviously the last session we did before this week, and uh, you were struggling with a bit of testosterone. Oh, my it? God, yeah. <laughs> did he, didn't he drop his dummy and go for a poo? Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God, I couldn't believe it. So hopefully that will, t- you know, here's me going, oh, yes, he's gonna, He's just amazing. He never does anything wrong. <laughs> and dogs. then, yeah, that he's a dog. He's yeah. a dog, and he's 19, 20 months old now. Yeah. And I think he's just beginning to realise what those bits are between his legs are four 100%. so he's he's like going well do you know what? i know what i'm doing i've done it a million times but oh there's a pretty girly over there who smells nice <laughs> so 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 sort of what i'm doing with him now is i'm going right back to basics yeah i always go back to basics and say right okay got a little issue probably that's coming you need to grow up yeah so i'm not going to ask you any major questions in your training yeah we'll stick with what we can do until you kind of grow up yeah, in effect, become a man, basically. Yeah. I think that, you know, for me, it's half half the battle is just knowing where you're at. I think clients, owners, handlers, what you know, whatever you want to call people that have dogs, very much don't have the right expectations or they have expectations that aren't actually realistic, which then breeds frustration. I think the beauty of obviously where you and I are at with, with having so much time with dogs is you can just kind of go, you know what, they are a dog reading the dog really just becomes second nature which is yes. obviously what we try and teach isn't it I think being realistic particularly from eight months to kind of 18 months which is quite interesting to hear that that's when you ramp up your training because that's what I say yeah. to people you know don't think you're done at eight months you need to be doing no that's when it that changes time. because they, they're growing every day every time I say to all my clients every time they go out the front door or even in the house when they wake up yeah. they're going to learn something yeah. They're going to learn something. Now, it's either going to include you or it's not going to include you, whatever they learn. You know, and if they learn, they can have fun without you by chasing, you know, racing around like loonies with other dogs or anything. Then, of course, they're going to pick that first. Yeah. Absolutely. So I always say to people, make sure when your dog goes out, you're on the same page. Yeah. OK. And he's going to learn something that's beneficial to you. Yeah. You know, because you're going to own him for like 12, 13, 14 years. Obviously, dogs go wrong. Of course they do. I mean, you shouldn't say stuff. Obviously, my dogs chase rabbits the first time they see them, yeah. you know, but you have to say, OK, chased a rabbit today, job done. Right now we're going back and we're going to sort that out. Yeah. You know, and we, we set up training scenarios where they've got the chance to chase. Not real rabbits. It's called a bolting bunny. OK. So it's a gun dog dummy with fur on it. It's on a piece of elastic. OK. And you basically pull it, the elastic tight. And when your dog is hunting... For a, dummy, a normal dummy or it's just running about you can ping it okay so this little bolting bunny you know looks like it's running across the ground and you can teach your dog what it should do when that happens it's all sort of like building building up your dog's you know learning bank that's it I mean I know for me the foundations of gun dog training I have used every single day you know where I walk I walk in a wooded area every day with a really high population of squirrels and monk jacks and I can very confidently say I can stop Hogan on a monk jack my other dog Marley does what he likes she's amusing but um, <laughs> and that's why I was really shocked when we came back to gun dog training and I was blowing my stock whistle like some kind of wally and he's yeah. with his nose on the ground pretending I wasn't even there and I'm dying of small death in the corner <laughs> but he does you know on a on a day-to-day basis I can use a mouth whistle and and he does listen and I would never ever not put that work into a dog because the, yeah. the rewards back now of being able to be relaxed, you know, I'm so much more relaxed when I'm just out with Hogan with no other dogs yeah. and just totally chilled because I know he listens and he's not perfect. You know, no dog ever is, but it's safe and it's fun and I'm not going to lose him. And I think most people just want those key components in their life even if they don't want to be doing big dog sports and just on that note Abby you know I'm I'm obviously coming along with Hogs we're getting a new puppy as you know and spend a bit of time with him and obviously get his training on point again so I can involve him when I train the puppy where could I go with my training if I said to you I would like to work towards a gun dog test what does that look like you know what would we need to be achieving on a regular basis Okay, so if you wanted to enter like a test, you would need a dog that walks the heel off the lead. You need a dog that is steady to anything that is thrown. 
Yeah. Okay. You need a dog that you could lie now and he ran in the direction that you pointed him and then he would stop when you told him to stop and he would handle, which means he would go left, right, back, yeah. forwards, whichever way you needed for him to go to pick the dummy. It also means that you need to understand about the wind, how a dog works, how your dog is actually like trying to scent the dummy. He's not looking for it. He's using his nose. You need to take into account the lie of the ground. So if you're sending him out on a hill, he's always going to drop down the hill. Yeah. So you need to line him you know, higher up the hill. All these little things. And he'd also have to go out, find a dummy and come straight back and deliver it. So that's what you'd need for a working test. That's to do anything, you've got to be able to tick all those boxes first. Yeah, not, not necessarily a puppy test. So puppy tests are in a dog age between, I think it's six months and 18 months. You would need all those things. Obviously, it's short distances. You know, it's much more simplified. Once you get into novice and open level, you're talking about you need to handle your dog maybe 150 yards away from you. He has to stop at that distance, go left, go right, go back when he's told if you if you know you want to be in the awards your dog basically is 150 yards away he's got who knows what he can smell while he's out there and he's got to be well trained enough to listen to you and do what you ask yeah with all those distractions around him and then is there another level up from that so when you get that that's your first test that's done is it just a repetition of tests and those competitions yeah. similar yeah. or is there more you, you start in puppy and then you'd go to novice dog, novice handler, which means neither you nor the dog have won a competition. OK, then there's novice level. And once you've won out of novice, you go into open level working tests and th there's nowhere higher. You just keep entering open after open after open and you can win as many of those as you can. All right. And you're okay. in competition with everybody else then at that point, because obviously everybody's yeah. doing the same thing. So it's just who does it best. Yeah. Yeah. You have judges on the day and they give you a score out of 20 and the dog with the most points wins. And so you must have been to several of these. I've been to thousands. Yeah. <laughs> so, so tell yeah. me about when it goes wrong. It surely goes wrong, right? Well, can't, I, can't I tell you about when it goes right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sure it's great most of the time, but there's got to be that one dog. Yeah, of course no. there is. Like, even, <laughs> even, even like my best trained dog. So Maya, my oldest dog, I can't actually remember doing her anything wrong once she got to a certain level. But when I first started with Maya, she would run in all the time that means shot will be fired dummy thrown you have to wait for the judge to send you you know he'll say like number four send your dog and I'd look down and my like already gone I don't know <laughs> she was like I can get it I can find it so so that just means it was too distracting for her to listen yeah. to me when yeah. we first started I mean she was great she always marked it to the to the blade of grass and came back right but then you just get a naught for a run in. But then I thought, right, there's my training for the next few months is actually see a dummy. You don't go for it till you're told. On top of your working tests, you have field trials, which are competitions using live game. So meant to be based on a shoot day. So it's using you know, real game. So this is why you, where your field trial champions come yeah. in and looking at read lines and stuff. So I didn't know yeah. this. So these, yeah. these, that's the, the difference between the two, working trials and then field working, trials. Actually yeah. Doing it with yeah. Present. yeah, they're, they're actually uh, working tests. I think working trials is something slightly different. Sorry, yeah, I used yeah. to do working trials. At the yeah. of it, like Hogan and I. So, yeah, sorry, working tests. is the, the Working number. tests, yeah. yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, as you talked before, when it goes wrong, you know, do you know what? I didn't win the Red Rosette today. Fine. I've got my homework for the next week. But do you see dogs just kind of go... See you later. <laughs> In a minute. Yeah. <laughs> I'm having a great time. I mean, you know, yeah. surely you're going to get that one that's a joker and wants to, to play yeah. around. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've owned a couple of jokers, but like one time I sent Roxy out. Uh, she's 13 now. She's an amazing game finding dog. She lives to go on shoots. Right. That's her thing. She's just fabulous on a shoot. I mean, you know, everyone you say, oh, is she for sale? Can we buy her? I was like, no. Oh. But yeah, but. On a working test, you wouldn't want to buy her because she was really well trained. She won four or five competitions. But this little switch had got up in her brain because she wasn't fussed about picking up dummies. Right. And she'd go, oh, I'm bored now. So I'd get like 19s and 20s out of 20. And I was going, oh, this is great. I might win. Yeah. And then she'd do something like she'd go out and she'd bring back a banana skin. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Brilliant. Oh. 
it was, there, well, there was a water retrieve once and she went out there and there's this really smelly old like rotting fish <laughs> so so like the dummy was like say at 12 o'clock on a clock face in the water and there's a smelly old fish like miles away so at nine o'clock <laughs> she, win- she winded the fish she was nowhere near where she should be and brought this fish back <laughs> so so you know it, it's every dog has its strengths you know look I'm I'm very much rules and boundaries for dogs just being constantly bribing dogs is just not my thing I think that's no really unfair on the majority of dogs so I generally look for a nice balance but prep them really well but I think taking Hogan into that environment I can forgive apart from when he wants to run in because you know I have to be very careful with that I don't always trust him especially at the start of the class and I did have to stop him twice on Tuesday yeah Um, that's fine that's training though isn't it as you we keep saying then they're dogs they're not robots Exactly. But I think it's the eagerness to please is beyond anything like you see. You put a dog like that in an environment where he thrives and is familiar to him and his desire to get it right is just insane. You know, when he's gone off and I'm looking at you going, oh, my God, like he's got fireworks in his head. You know, even think about telling him off at that point when he's desperate. Like you said to me, he can go out for a dummy, me and him, no problem at all. Won't even think twice. Bang out, you know, 10 in a row, no problem. But the, I've not taken into consideration the lineup of dogs behind me because they didn't mean anything to me. And the first thing you said to me was, well, he's got competition for this dummy. That's why he's panicking and running around yeah. like oh, this chicken. You can never lose sight of the fact that these animals have got huge hearts and huge characters. And I think you really, I really see that, that quality time I spend with him. I would encourage anyone, whatever you've got, whatever breed you've got, but to go and find something that allows you to yeah. go and practice their innate drive. Exactly, exactly. And then this bond between you, it just grows and you just end up having like a best mate. Yeah. I've got like 10 best mates at the minute. Like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I've seen your truck. <laughs> <laughs> your truck's hilarious now. Like there's not going to be much room for their heads to be sticking out the back if you add another one. And then I'm not going to have another one for a long time. Tens enough, thank you. <laughs> They're all so different. That's what makes it really interesting to train. But if people just put the extra time in in the beginning... You just get this amazing working bond. You know, it doesn't have to be working on a shoot, but just a day-to-day bond. And then your walks will be enjoyable. Your time with them in the house will be enjoyable because actually, you know, they know that rewards are coming, you know, if they do something that you like. I think that's the thing for me also to see the dog's perception of a reward because, I mean, if he doesn't run in, I do give a sly treat because I really want to mark the fact that he's not budged. But the majority of the time, we don't really use treats when we're in a class. In fact, um, one of the other ladies that was in the, the class with us said, oh, I don't see anybody using treats, but I still use them. Well, that's OK. It's fine for you. Don't worry about anyone else. For me, when I watch Hogan work, the joy that just having the dummy in his mouth and, and particularly when you add in water, which you know what he's like with water, just yeah. like some kind of flying fish, that, that's his reward, just doing the activity yeah. and getting it right. And I don't need to keep putting treats in. Treats to him are irrelevant. If you give him a, a dummy or a tennis ball or a pile of treats, he will go for the dummy and the tennis ball first. He'll try and grab the treat after, but it's always second. And I've done that little experiment. I just feel you get this real intuitive, trusting relationship with them when you spend this time with with them doing what they love to do. Exactly. I I always think you use lots of rewards in the beginning. Be it. I always say to people, actually, um, whatever you think is a reward might not be what your dog thinks is a reward. Yeah. Just because you've gone and bought out, like, you know, some treats from Tesco's or whatever. Actually, if your dog doesn't like them, that's not a reward. No. You know, if your dog would prefer a ball and you keep trying to give it food, then it will not learn the behaviour that you want him to learn as quick. So work out yeah. what your dog finds rewarding and use that a lot in the beginning when you're trying to teach a behaviour or a new skill. As they get good or better at you know, whatever you're trying to teach them, the rewards become less because actually they enjoy doing what they're doing. Absolutely. You know, as, as you're saying. So then, like my older dogs now, I hardly give them any treats yeah. at all. Because actually, they're actually, the reward is being allowed to go out on that retrieve. Or for yeah. a spaniel, the reward might be, okay, you've gone and picked that dummy up. Now we can go hunting together. That's what I love about it. And then if you if you ever have an issue with any part of your training, go back a few paces and bring back the rewards. Yeah. 
start using rewards again to say actually let's relearn yeah. it and then drop the treats off as they get better again and and then you're off so with regards to kind of gun dog trainers and and training classes and stuff obviously in the majority of dog training worlds there is very little kind of regulation or regulatory bodies in my industry we have a few who are who are accredited but generally even those associations or memberships are in conflict with each other which makes the whole industry very tricky to be a part of what's it like in your world abby does anybody kind of check is there any regulation does anybody check what you're doing do you ha- are you a member of any associations do you need to be you don't need to be at all so your your neighbour could set up their own gun dog training business tomorrow. Obviously, there are lots of, the same as in pet dog sort of thing, there are lots of accredited courses and stuff you can do, but there's no one body that oversees it all. Do you find that there's um, lots of conflict or just do people rub along okay? What's it like for you? Uh, trainer-wise, people tend to rub along. You know, obviously, most of it is word of mouth. Mm-hmm. You know, I personally, I just think you can have all the letters after your name. You can go and do all these courses, do this, do that. But until you've had your hands on a thousand dogs, mm-hmm. not literally, I mean, had a yeah. thousand dogs through your hands, yeah. training them, I think you need on the ground experience to say, yeah. actually, I am, I'm a trainer yeah. as such. So you kind of have to do your apprenticeship yeah. first. Um, but there are, there are lots of like online courses and everything that you can do most of them are good you you learn stuff which can only be helpful sure. it's one of my biggest bugbears it's the same in my industry that people can just set up tomorrow and call themselves a behaviorist and come out of a city job and and you know do a two-day course but actually there is absolutely a platform for academia in what I do which is why I've spent the best part of thirty thousand pounds getting to where I'm at now academically because there are things you can't see in the dog there are you know, neurological things that you you need to understand. You need to understand psychology on a deeper level. You need to understand other people's experiences and opinions to be able to form your own. But I think dog training, where you're actually needing to work with that dog on a direct day-to-day basis to get it to do a repetitive thing, a specific repetitive thing, you're absolutely right. You know, if they wanted to get involved, the the best thing they could do is actually be with a mentor for five years and be working on the ground. And yeah, all right, do some academic stuff to understand the dog's makeup and the anatomical side of the dog and how dogs work and how they think. Obviously, there's always room for that. But I think for me, actual training is not something that I would, you know, consider that I do day in, day out, all day, every day. I'm not the best. I'm quite happy to sit back and be a student. I love coming to the classes and being a pupil. I see loads of trainers, loads of different trainers around the country because I I want to see how they train, what they say. Go, I like that. I hadn't thought of that. I didn't didn't know that. And then you build up your own sort of like way of teaching. So definitely, definitely that. And also what you need in your toolbox, as you know, Joe, is a thousand different ways to teach the dog the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not just the dog, it's the people. Like coaching tennis, you you know, a forehand's a forehand, a backhand's a backhand with topspin, for example. I needed a hundred thousand different ways to teach one person that compared to the next person because people learn differently yeah and so do dogs you need lots of different ways to get to the same end post that's where puppy coach came from really because puppy coach is me if you want me it's me remotely it's me in your face it's my book it's my video series it's all the social media stuff so however you learn whether you're a visual learner whether you you read you take in text however you learn I tried to put a program together that there would be something in there for everybody to learn something from because of exactly what you said. The way I learn is I want to watch someone who can do it. Yeah. And then I want to have a go myself. Yeah, exactly. I think that's the best way. Um, I just want to just quickly touch on the different side and a world that I don't really know anything about at all is the HPR world, which is your Vizslers. Do you get involved in that? Well, recently, there's been a massive increase in the number of HPRs that come to River Lily, especially Vishlers. They're like pretty much every other dog seems to be a Vishler at the minute. Personally, I will hold my hands up. I'm no expert on them. OK, so if you come to River Lily, you'll you'll sign your terms and conditions that will say, actually, we can help you with your retrieving and your general hunting. HPR stands for Hunt, Point and Retrieve Breeds. Right. So, so these dogs are all air scenting dogs um, who are actually bred to the whole package. 
Okay, so historically your spaniels are bred for hunting, flushing out the game. Yeah. Your Labradors are bred for retrieving the game, although obviously yeah. they could do both. But your HPRs, your hunt, point and retrieve are bred. So it's basically you only need one dog because in theory it should do all of those three things. Yeah, it will hunt out the game for yeah. you. It, it will stand on point, okay, or it will point. So it basically point at the, the game that it's found. You then catch up with it. You tell the dog to flush it. Bird or rabbit gets up, you shoot it. Then that dog, that same dog will retrieve it. Well, I'm a bit blown away by that because yeah. the business yeah. that I've met, well, to get them to focus and do anything is really hard work. Yeah. So yeah. to do all those three things and not be bored and go off and do something else, it must yeah. be an insane level of training. <laughs> yeah, it is insane. But to watch them on the moors, which is where they're bred, to like work they they need huge open spaces they are super fit yeah they can, they can go for all day you know um working what we find is actually hunt point retrieve they love the first two they love the hunting the pointing retrieving is not their first love it's third in their name it's to me it seems like some of them love it some of them don't yeah. so that's what they were they were bred for. I mean, we have loads come at River Lily, but what we work on is just like basic obedience and gun dog skills of um, hunting and retrieving. Yeah. And that's really useful because I, you know, I often see Vizslers and I kind of knew they were a multitasking dog, but could never, by the time I see them, they're being, they're pet dogs in homes doing none of this stuff generally and actually can have a lot of issues. Yeah. And I see a lot of them for, you know, resource guarding at the minute is off the scale. I think the pandemic has, has really destroyed dogs socially right now. And, and Vizslers and those real kind of finely tuned breeds, breeds are definitely struggling. And, and I've yeah. had a few come through that are just off the scale aggressive. And I guess it makes sense if they're being bred to have such diverse level of, of work in genetic material, then trying to shut that down in a, in a domestic home with two walks a day is just never going to happen yeah, is it really? it's not going to happen and also they're quite like especially these are very sensitive you know they're quite needy and sensitive but then equally they're quite well hey let's go and do what I want to do as well Abby that's amazing thank you so much for for this I mean I think it's been a it's a great whistle stop tour for me as well I feel like I my hobbies kind of with the dogs I like to do a little bit of everything and I've done all sorts of stuff with Hogs, as you know and you know he's an amazing gun dog and I love nothing more than seeing him work and finding that time to come and, and hang out with you but actually even for me that this has been really useful to kind of put it all together I'm not sure I'd ever be brave enough to go and do a test we'll, we'll train you up to do a novice dog novice handler oh, because actually God. no but a novice dog novice handler it's it's like a really great introduction because judges are nice and friendly well they're nice and friendly anyway the judges but novice dog novice handler they tend to be a little bit more lenient and they'll sort of give you advice and stuff and it's a great way right. to start I know where our weaknesses are because I never spent any time really teaching him straight lines and left and right. It's all about kind of, I'm just pointing over there, hoax, you know, go use your nose. Um, and you'll yeah. see that when, when we do stuff together, he'll, I'll kind of, the line that I send him, he'll veer off right or left. But he is so awesome that it would be lovely to see what we can do. I mean, I know a lot, lot of people don't agree with it and I totally respect that. But if you ever took Hogan on a shoot, you would just be amazed at what your dog does on a shoot. He yeah, has because... um, he has brought me a pheasant. He brought me, uh, he was about 18 months and it was the first pheasant he'd ever brought me. Again, I, I probably shouldn't say this because I'm going to get in so much trouble <laughs> when I keep my horn. Um, but he brought me this live pheasant. And you know when you have, I was again, I was on the horse, jumped off because we were back at the field. And you have this split second, don't you, to think, oh, how do I handle how do I handle this? Cannot tell him off. I just said to yeah. him, Oh my goodness, you're amazing. I've done loads of retrieval work with him. What have you got? Sit. And it got this bird off him, held its wings shut, sit there, wait, took him far enough away, told him to wait and let this thing go. And then just made such a massive fuss of fuss with him but he literally it, it just blows me away that they don't hurt them I mean he yeah. just it didn't yeah. harm a feather on this bird's you know body at all so I know he can do it and I know he'd deliver me a bird that was sound yeah. um and live but well, I don't know whether uh <laughs> I don't know if it's for me I prefer <laughs> canvas dummies <laughs> <laughs> come in one year and just to watch them hunt all right i'll need a bit of nurturing but i'll i'll go with it it's a plan <laughs> where can people find you abby 
Okay, they can find us. We're actually based in Hertfordshire, near the town of, well, city actually of St Albans, yeah. sort of around about that area. We also have ground in Essex. We train in Cambridgeshire, Bedfordshire. I think that's probably it actually. Quite quite a wide area that we run different lessons on. Okay. Um, got a website, www.riverlilyworkingdogs.co.uk. River Lily spelled, spelled just uh, R-I-V-E-R-L-I-L-Y, River okay. Lily. Yeah. Uh, we're also on Facebook and we've got a Friends of uh, River Lily page on there. And we're also on Instagram, actually. Fabulous. Thank you so much for your time. It's been awesome to, to catch up. I will see you very very soon and um yeah we'll wrap it up thank you to everybody for listening thanks abby thanks to everybody for listening Mm -hmm. hopefully you've uh enjoyed this week's podcast and learned lots i certainly have and we'll see you very soon